Okay, it's time for Q and A clarifications. Uh, please um, be short if you take the floor. Anne-Marie from Australia. Um, this is a question for the two centres um, because I think it's wonderful what you've done and what you're doing, but I'm lamenting that we have done this and we've sold our property, uh, which began in 20, 2007 and was sold last year. So we've lost this. My question is, um, do you have a bottom line, financial bottom line that is going to govern or um, determine whether you continue into the future? Um, for the Chatelain, I don't think that the financial bottom line will be the main risk. The, the house is more or less running well, in terms of finance, it's just balanced, uh, and then uh, investment will have to come from the province and from donors. Uh, the main risk, I would say, for the Châtelain is the decrease of the number of Jesuits. So it's another question, and it may be more difficult than the financial one. Thank you. Okay, I don't know. I. I don't know if I should continue. Should I? Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I don't know the, the size of the land um, you have, the size and uh, the products are they for just for the people there to feed on or is it for commercial purposes? Okay, my name is Cornelius, for those who prefer English, for those who understand, my name is Obiora, it means the hearts of all in my language, thank you. I'm a Jesuit. Mother, cantar muy bien. Apart from being an excellent singer, our gardens have 105 square meters because, because uh, these are all people who work on the gardens. They have their pension. I mean, some have good pensions, some others don't. But these gardens are for therapeutical purposes, um, leisure purposes. We want to obtain good bio produce. They, they share the produce with their children. These are social gardens, relational gardens. So, of course, you cannot make ends meet. Uh, with the produce of the garden. And since they are 430, they um, have a surface of 65,000 square meters. Uh, there's, the good there's a big garden uh, for one of the initiatives, but these are basically veggie gardens, um, tomato, cucumber, um, courgette, pumpkin, onions, up to 40 or 50 um, produce. And then at the school, we have apple trees, pear trees, <laughs> all kinds of berries. I can speak faster if you want. So the two gardens are different because in our faculty, we cannot take on so much veggie. But we also have peppers, courgettes, aubergines, um, onions, etc. But the main purpose is to produce and people go there to produce, to plant. And so uh, biologically, at the beginning, they are uh, not familiarized with bioproduction, but they then they take to it and it generates and a really nice atmosphere and extremely therapeutical in nature. We've measured that. We conducted a study on the social impact of gardens and people go less and less to the doctor. So the public uh, health system uh, owes us. I have a question for, for Jaime. Um, you spoke of, of 
three books, let's say two books in the classical tradition, and you added the, the life, uh, the experience that could be included in the creation book. But let's say there are three books. Um, and in a way, the spiritual exercises introduce us to the book of, uh, of my life, of experience, and to the book of the Bible. Um, but for the book of creation, it does not give us any spiritual tool, how to pray with nature, in nature, uh, supported by nature. Um, so do, outside of the spiritual exercises, uh, in other spiritual tradition, have you identified um, schools, I mean, like tools, like the spiritual exercises that would help us to pray? And not only environmental literacy, but really to, to pray with it. Um, and if I push a little bit, uh, it's often a joke with other Jesuits, but um, I chose inside the pedagogy of the spiritual exercises to join the Jesuits with one sentence of the Bible. From outside, it's crazy. Are we going to say that one day people may choose based on something they've read from a tree, from a bird, like we choose reading something from the Bible. I don't have an answer. Maybe Mark, uh, Mark can help me since he is also teaching environmental uh, science and eco-spirituality, and he even probably has more ideas than I do. But I'd say that uh, we need to explore uh, we certainly need um, environmental literacy, so we need science, and and we need to bring science out of the classroom. And there is a, a school of thought that proposes to teach students outside into the wild or in the wild or even bring the whole school out. And I think there are some interesting experiences in the U.S. and Canada, not so much here in Spain, as far as I know. And I've tried to, uh, I actually done it just once um, to offer uh, a walking retreat. So along the Camino de Santiago. So it was a, a group of uh, six university students, a small group. And we would um, have like a meditation every day uh, based on a scripture, but also on some, if you want scientific fact, like hydrology or uh, the vegetation we're seeing. So we walked along the, the Camino. Uh, so we started in the Pyrenees and we walked along the Aragon River um, for six days. And then we had to walk in silence for an hour and people would have to reflect on their own in the afternoon. Um, so I chose the topic and then we would celebrate the Eucharist at the end of the day and also had some time to rest and play cards, not just praying all the time. So also, <laughs> Uh, laser was important and that's my experience very limited experience because where i work at comillas we don't have much room because the institution doesn't let you to explore uh these type of things we don't even have a house uh, near the mountains where we could go and spend two days there and teach them there so we're trying to do that maybe in a couple of years but we haven't done that yet someone else wants to add something on this topic well, yeah, my name is Mark Mackey from Chicago in the U.S. I I guess I would just add um, from my experience and others using natural history, as we would call it, in kind of the Western science tradition, learning specifically about names of plants and animals. Um, that can keep us stuck at just like the scientific name and that can stay in a headspace. But I've found that learning about the story of a species does kind of break open and, and it, it's kind of the classroom outside. Um, and so that's maybe from the Western sense to, you know, to get at this line of, well, we're asking people to care for nature, but how can you care about what you don't know? And how can you, how can you love what you don't know? Um, there's a author in the U S an indigenous author, wrote a popular book called Braiding Sweetgrass. You're familiar? Um, I'd really recommend it. And that brings an indigenous perspective alongside of her professional 
perspective as a botanist. Um, so I think there's some potential dialogue to tap into other traditions that do use, um, have ways of praying. Um, just a couple of thoughts about how we can bring these together, but also in our collaborating and care for our common home in the fourth UAP kind of focus on the collaborating part and kind of having the humility to say, um, Christians can learn from other traditions as well. I, I'm Fredrik Kering from Sweden. I have a comment for Javier. We should acknowledge the debt, what we owe to the Franciscan tradition, because the Book of Creation comes from Bonaventura and St. Francis of Assisi. And we can move on with Francis Bacon that you mentioned, Jaime. And it's like an obligation that we have in our tradition to acknowledge, or maybe we should say out loud, that it's more natural and genuine. It belongs to the DNA of the Franciscan tradition to be closer to nature. What we are doing here in the symposium is a way to work with this notion of uh, creative loyalty and to develop Ignatian tradition. But I want to be a bit provocative here. You didn't mention competence. How can we contribute within the Ignatian tradition? How can we contribute to go beyond what exists in Franciscan tradition? The examples of Valladolid and Lyon are eye-opening eye -opening examples of creative loyalty, but from a theoretical standpoint, there's a lot of work to do to compare. There, are, there is a very nice tool, which is to visit a Museum of uh, Natural History. Uh, I think I, I often recommend that, and for me, so it's a very big experience. And I think we could uh, work out some tools uh, of uh, helping pe people uh, visiting this uh, museum and praying and getting in and, and having it, visiting it with uh, the faith uh, look. That is very nice. Trevor Scott from uh, Canada. Um, just picking up on uh, how we can uh, better pray with nature. A couple of years ago in Canada, we had an ecological retreat. And one of our activities was having John McCarthy, who's a, a Canadian Jesuit ecologist, lichenologist in particular, on a little plot of land on the property of our retreat house in Sudbury, Ontario, north of Toronto. John walked us through, in about 20 minutes, how the forest relates with itself, you know, the role of mushrooms and how the different trees relate with each other. And that was a fascinating um, time of the retreat because being in, the, being in a forest, it's very Baroque. There are all these beautiful details, but it's hard to make sense of them. And John, within 20 minutes, was able to kind of encapsulate how the forest relates with itself. And he made, he helped make the forest a simpler place, uh, more relatable, um, as beautiful as being in the forest is. So it was a wonderful, um, that was a wonderful moment of the retreat. So having someone like that uh, on a retreat, uh, a prayer companion, almost like a docent in an art gallery, wonderful. I do have a, a, an unrelated question, and I was thinking about this when Javier was speaking about the how we can help our Jesuit communities and our apostolates become more ecologically minded in terms of practice and, and mindfulness. And that is the role of a province ecological coordinator or assistant 
because we're struggling with that in Canada, in our province, of finding someone uh, like an actual physician in our province who is considered uh, an ecological assistant, could be a lay person, of course, a uh, Jesuit. Um, and that's something that we're looking at. And I wonder if there's any successful, fruitful practices in other provinces that have on the province staff an ecological coordinator or assistant to help Jesuit communities and our apostolates better be with a more coordinated approach rather than just individual apostolates trying to figure it out themselves, a more coordinated approach on the province level to be more ecologically minded um, through the role of an assistant or, or a coordinator. Well, I can answer to the question. Um, this may be pride, um, but I would say that's what I've been asked to do in the past three years and a half in my province with the two young women we've recruited. So I am the coordinator, the delegate, and we have recruited one and then another uh, lay person. And if is it a success? Well, I don't know. Um, we've worked and we've managed to move some lines. Um, the lines we were moving in the Jesuits community had impact in some of our institutions. That's why we recruited a second uh, lay woman to work with me. But the schools were trying to uh, call us to help them. Um, and it was too much work for, the, for myself half time and for Gabriella full time. So, and then um, there are outside uh, signs that this was not a total failure because, and Felipe may be able to say more, but Frank Janin was the coordinator of the European provincials. And based on the experience of the province, he's asked uh, the other European provinces to name an eco coordinator. And they came for a meeting, for first time in person meeting at Chatla. Uh, three or four months ago. So of course the reality of uh, this mission as eco-coordinator is very different. Most of the Jesuit companions or lay person have 5% of their time, 10% of their time, but that's, that's a beginning um, and we hope uh, there will be more. Jose Ignacio is the coordinator for this province, for example. Uh, Jacek was here, his coordinator for his Polish province. Um, so I, I would say, I, think, I don't know if it's a success, but at least we are spending energy and time and a bit of money. Thank you very much to the three of you. I'm Javier from Manresa. This is the second week, right, if we take into account um, the symposium. Today's key is the choice, uh, the selection process, and we've heard from two beautiful examples as to how this is being implemented. So I would say, well, one has an explicit discernment process um, it's an initiative by the provincial, so top down, but with very courageous implementations by the province and by the team in charge. And on the other hand, INEA, INEA's example is more anarchic in nature, charismatic, um, gaining traction, and it's transforming things through the life of the project. So these are two very interesting uh, models of transformational and efficient action. So thank you. Thanks to both of you. In the second week, and going back to Jaime's presentation, you mentioned three axes, uh, word, so the inspiration sources for transformation, so God's word, of course, in Christian tradition, the gaze on the creation, but then 
indigenous people's wisdom um, have a lot to say and can contribute a lot, as we've been saying repeatedly. So we are aware of the different inspiration sources of the word that can help us inspire our action. Secondly, now rituals, uh, be it uh, through sacraments or sacramentals, I'm not sure if there's much difference between both, but that's another discussion. So rituals. The symbolic strength of uh, ritualizing processes, when you find a way of doing it, they are very powerful. And then specific actions with different processes included. And something very important you mentioned was the very famous quote by the Pope, time is greater than space. Oh, you were the one who quoted the Pope, Felix. So processes. Second week has to do with the process. The process of taking action. And this has to do with courage. You need to step away from the old paradigm and we need to step away collectively as a community, not individually. So the exercises of the second week can help us develop these collective conversion processes. Uh, just to go back a little to what was being said earlier on, um, in the context of where I am, we have mapped out on the landscape uh, maybe 12 places for reflection, both in a traditional context and in an ecological one. And usually these, these are places where there's a transition either in the landscape reflecting a transition in the culture um, or a source. And uh, we're in a sense, for the sake of diverse languages of the people who come, um, uh, putting signages up to explain what is going on ecologically and what is the spiritual point of stopping at this place. So, if you like, we're, we're trying to, um, it's a bit like some of the signages here explaining uh, where Ignatius has been or what he's doing, explaining uh, the chapels or the different places. But this is where the culture sees a transition or a source that is reflected really in the particular um, ecology that's there, whether it's, for example, going from pioneer species to what we call pillar species in the ecosystem, whether there are false climaxes, um, what in the bamboo garden, what are the different sources and creativity of the culture in using the bamboos, and um, where the spiritual connection in this is. So um, there are, um, I feel, many things that really need to get shared in this way, um, how to find um, both the spirit of the culture um, and, and the landscape. And we might also look at this, as you were saying, in uh, terms of the history. I'm Irish and every well in Ireland is St. Patrick's well. Yeah, we've... <laughs> <laughs> adopted everything from yeah, a pagan tradition, if you like, <laughs> and baptized it. Um, so um, it uh, the landscape can really speak to us. And I use the word landscape because this has been scaped by human interaction. Uh, this is what's important for us. Thank you. Muchas gracias a los tres.
I want to thank you all for your presentations. They were extremely eye-opening. I'm Alejandro, a Jesuit from this community in Manresa. I'd like to thank, share with you a difficulty I've been facing since the very beginning of the symposium. Let's see if you can help me think about it. And that is whether we are finding it hard to include the ecological issue or any other in the inner process of the exercises because the approaches I'm hearing are asymptotic in nature and not direct ones for the exercises I mean. So are we maybe imposing an agenda that is not uh, strictly about the exercises? I'm thinking about the internal process, we can discuss um, the environment, uh, we could discuss sexuality in the future or the Champions League and the exercises. We can include any topic we want, but maybe we are imposing an agenda that is not included in the exercises per se. I understand that conversion in the exercises emanates or flourishes on the basis of a living relationship and not the topic that is proposed, a living relationship with Christ and the Jesus of the gospel. The order in the Ignatian meaning emanates from a relationship and not an agenda or a topic. So what will generate change in us, the retreatants and the companions, is the link, the relationship, the affection. De hecho, Ignacio dice Actually, Ignatius says in the annotations that the companion must not impose his point of view or his agenda on the person he's accompanying. Maybe we should talk about Ignatian ecology, and not ecology and exercises, maybe. So, I don't know. This is my final, my final question, and I don't know if uh, anyone can help me here how to tackle the ecological conversion process from the relation with Christ himself. Thank you. I would, I would invite you to reading this little booklet on ecological conversion. It uh, discusses the uh, exercises. The good part is by Tonio Garcia, and he's uh, he has a special relation with uh, Christ, and he knows the exercises well, and he's incorporated the care of the common home because that's the reality. That's where we meet in Christ with this dynamic of the exercises. I don't doubt that this is the theme because uh, where we meet with Christ and where do we relate with Christ with, with prayer but then in reality you, you meet elsewhere and I think it's it's well connected and I hope you find the time to, to read Tonio's texts because I think they can help you. Uh, comment uh, to the previous comment uh, by Javier about the use of the expression choice. I'm not an expert. You've analyzed the text of the exercises, but choice, choice, uh, well, that's because you choose certain lifestyle and part of the process of the exercises has to do with easing this, this choosing of a uh, of a lifestyle, so maybe we should use the plural form, so not choice, but choices, and how to educate ourselves and illustrate ourselves in terms of decision-making, so choices, making uh, food, transportation, time management, so it's so much that's included, it affects everything, so it's, uh, well, a series of choices that the community needs to make because sometimes it depends on the community in which we live or the province or your family or the civil society you live in, what the, the decisions, what choices are made by your town hall or your uh, government of the country. So it's a network of choices. So maybe that that would be appropriate to, to talk about in the second we have to handle and manage choices and how to help uh, people make decisions in plural. Just a comment. 
And that takes us to the idea of process. It's not an, it's an open process. It's not about, okay, I made my choice. I made my decision and that's it. No, you need to continue choosing. It's Blondel. It's, uh, I mean, you cannot avoid uh, choices and decisions and decision making. I want to give a statement to this um, question. Do we put a topic on the spiritual exercises if we are talking about ecology in the spiritual exercises? I do not believe it because St. Ignatius, after the vision of Cardonero, or after his enlightenment, he said, I have to proclaim what I have seen. Even the Holy Scripture doesn't exist. I have to proclaim what I have seen. So I would say the Holy Scripture, he started with the Holy Scripture and then he contemplated the creation and he, this Scripture plus creation opened up his eyes to see God, and that the Holy Scripture is a corrective of what you have seen and, and feel and what I think it helps us to, to see where we are, who we are, and who is God. If we are talking about uh, the creation and ecology, if we, we understand it more. Just a very brief comment on the same thing. Um, I think that the current uh, eco-theology or um, deep, um, deep incarnation and um, Trinitarian theology in that context can have something to say to this um, understanding of um, trying to translate the exercises in this key um, without imposing. I think it's um, Ignatius drew from the spiritual and Catholic tradition deep in the um, patristics, and that is what current theology is doing in this space. And I think we can draw from some of that. Yes, so thinking about uh, your question, it's a, it's also my question really uh, deeply, and uh, I, I try to have some answers. I will tell you something, but uh, it still is a question. Um, I think that um, uh, in the choice, you have the freedom and your, the cho your answer to uh, the, the call of God, but also you have the discernment of the situation. So. What we can bring is the things that help the people to discern uh, about the situation where he is and what has to be done in the situation where he has. And then with the, the enlightenment of the mind, you you, you may your own way uh, answering the call of God in that situation. So I don't think that bringing some elements that make the things clear it is not, I don't think it is imposing something. I have a second uh, point or so. Um, when we offer a retreat on uh, ecology with the, ex the exercises, uh, the people who will come, they are not coming for uh, the exercises in general. And uh, they, you, have, you are proposing something uh, about ecology. It means that they they have a, a kind of a demand. Uh, I want to progress in this field, in this question. And what is the call of God for me uh, uh, in this situation? So we are not imposing. They have come to us uh, with this question, uh, with their demand uh, at the beginning of the retreat. And then, of course, we leave them to do their own way on all that. I don't think that is imposing uh, that uh, we propose something uh, on ecology and to try to go your own way with the, the exercises, uh, but with the question of, of ecology we are facing. Roberto Jaramillo. I'm Roberto Jaramillo. I would like to thank Jerome and Alejandro as well for the for the question because I share the very same question 
and I think it's important. Not having all the answers is important, just like your song says, Ignatius, wisely ignorant, following the spirit. And I think that that is what we are all trying to do here. Everybody speaks about the exercises based on each one's experience, and that's that's the idea here, how rich and diverse these experiences are. And in these past three days, I've also felt that the exercises sometime will stay there as a subtext, kind of a pretext, and yet the text is a different one because the word is Jesus. Jesus is the word, Jesus is the relation, and this has not been mentioned much. We haven't talked about the personal relation with uh, Jesus. Obviously, Jesus, Jesus incarnated, obviously, you know, 2,000 years, uh, Jesus resuscitated, uh, Jesus and the Jews, Jesus uh, crucifixion. I think we should, we should maintain that. And, and and go back to that question. I think that that's what changes the exercises, the relation with him, not with the scripture. He is the word, not the book of creation, not even his own story. He feeds the other three things. That's one thing that I wanted to share. And um, I mean, all due respect and gratitude for the presenters and the speakers, but I'm just saying oh, maybe these are questions for a uh, for, uh, next symposium. And another dimension that I've missed personally, I think somebody was, was saying that yesterday, can't remember who. And I think the Pope is ahead of us here as well. It's the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. It was mentioned, yes. I think it was in, uh, and also in Felix's presentation, it was it was more present because, uh, you know, people that work on those gardens, people who are retired, people who need that, even if uh, as therapy, maybe. But uh, in our at least half of the people here in our relation with the environment, our relation with creation is painful. It's really painful and, and, and tragic. The first world is to be found in Bogota and also the third world. And in Paris, there's people living in the third world, in New York. The third world and the fourth world are, are reality in Paris and New York as well. But integral ecology, it's not just about birds and the spring, that means, you know, people who don't have access to clean water, people who see how their lands are flooded or deserted, people with no land, people dispossessed, disowned, people with no trees. And I think Pedro, Pedro was uh, was talking about that yesterday or the day before, and he was um, warning, about, you know, so who are we sided with? With whom are we going to live and coexist and eat together and sleep together? How to conceptualize all of this? I think I think it's another entry door to this yeah, to this program of the exercises, exercises and integral ecology. Sorry, maybe I caused more confusion. Okay, so we will uh, jot down this question and many more for today and tomorrow. And now we will meet uh, the entrance. So remember, go to your room, change your shoes if necessary.